Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, wherever it is that you might be. We welcome you to the COVID-19 Vaccines, Facts, and Misconceptions. This is sponsored by the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing at NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing. We're delighted to have you with us today. This is such a big topic today. We still know that today there are facts that are out there, misconceptions that are out there, and this is another attempt to try to clarify for everyone what it, the, the separation between facts and misconceptions. We've got three experts with us today. We have, um, let me, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Mishi Yukawa. And Dr. Yukawa is the clinical professor of geriatrics and the medical director of the Community Living Center at San Francisco VA Medical Center. Second speaking will be Dr. Sandra Quinn Krauss. Dr. Krauss is the professor and chair of the Department of Family Science and the senior associate director of the Maryland Center of Health Equity in the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland. And our final speaker will be Dr. Sarah Berry. Dr. Berry is the associate director of the Mushlow and, and of the Musculoskeletal Research Center at the Hinda and Arthur Marcus Institute for Aging Research in Boston, an associate professor of medicine at Harvard. We're delighted to have these three experts with us today. The um, Dr. Yukawa will be talking on the, whoops, I just, on the um, efficacy of different vaccines for older adults. Dr. Kraus Quinn will speak about the key factors associated with increasing the vaccine uptake. And Dr. Berry will talk about lessons learned from the vaccine distribution in nursing homes. So we have a wide breadth of topics here to cover. We will, I'm asking you to use the question and answers box on the, um, on the Zoom and not the chat box. It's easier for us to take your questions. We will hold questions until after all the presentations, and then we will answer as many as we possibly can. This session will be recorded, so you can always go back into it. It will be housed on the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing site. You can go back into it and look at it again if you had some things that weren't clear. And also, you're going to get a survey in the mail tomorrow through Zoom, and we're going to be asking you to evaluate the, um, the value of this session. So thank you for being with us. And uh, Dr. Yukal, let's start with you. Thank you, Dr. Cortez, for the in introduction. And let me just get this on the slides. And for the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Dr. Cortez says, I am a geriatrician, clinician educator, and I've been a nursing home medical director for the past 12 years. And by far, this has been a very challenging issues to deal with. And I have been with all some of you who are also in the skilled nursing home uh, dealing with this COVID pandemic. Um, today, I'll be sharing some of the data uh, regarding efficacy of COVID vaccine in older adults. And I must tell you, I think the most important data are being gathered right now as more and more of our older adults are being vaccinated. Um, I will be talking about the Pfizer vaccine, Moderna, and soon to be coming up Johnson & Johnson vaccines. As you probably know, there are lots of other vaccines in the world. Uh, I know the Russians have their own, Chinese have their own, and there's an AstraZeneca vaccine, but for now, I'm only gonna be concentrating on these three vaccines, which is being available in the United States. So I will talk about the Pfizer vaccine, which is the first one that came online that the FDA approved for emergency use. It is a messenger RNA vaccine they did a phase two, three clinical trial, enrolled about 43,000 individuals. The mean age was 54 with an age range of 16 to 91. And this shows you the demographics and some um, information regarding the participants. 
as you can see, they enrolled um, about equal number of men and women. They try to be as ethnically diverse, but as you can see, majority of them were Caucasians. They did enroll some African-Americans as well as Hispanic and Latinx. And the age range, as you can see below. And here is the vaccine efficacy data. They determined the efficacy to be no sign of COVID vaccine seven days after they received the second dose of the vaccine. I make this point clear because uh, later on, I'll be talking to you about the Johnson Johnson vaccine, which had a different outcome. Now for this Pfizer vaccine, you can see that in old ages, even people above 65 and 75, the vaccine was efficacious in preventing COVID infection. And you can see for the race and ethnic group, there are also no difference, and there's no difference in gender either. So this is the data that the FDA used. And Based on this, they say efficacy is 95% of preventing symptoms of COVID infection after two doses. And this is why they were uh, approved to be used. So what are some of the common side effects? So the reactions were fat fatigue, headache or muscle aches, chills, joint pains or fever. And they seem to notice this among younger age group, those between 16 and 55 years old, rather than the older group. Now they define older as greater than 55 years old. But, um, I would consider it more 65 or 75 years old, um, but they tend to have more symptoms in the younger age group. And the symptoms have occurred after the second dose of the vaccine rather than the first dose. Just the anecdotal data, um, I lead a about 30 different facilities around San Francisco on a weekly seminar uh, related to COVID vaccine. These are 30 facilities of skilled nursing home or assisted living facilities around the Bay Area. And I took a poll with them last week when we met and they told me that no adverse events were found among their residents. So that, that's just the anecdotal data, but it would be interesting to see how people react after more and more of our residents in these skilled nursing home and other assisted living facilities receive their vaccines. So now I will switch gear to talk about Moderna vaccine. Again, this is a messenger RNA vaccine. They did a randomized double-blinded placebo control trial. 30,000 participants and their age range was 18 to 95. So this is a, um, actually their phase two trial where they were learned, uh, finding out which dose to do. And this is a dose dependent uh, data on how patients who received, the participant who received it mount an immunity. So this is a very small uh, number, only about 10 people in each of these groups can see that even people between 56 and 70 and those above 71 years old did mount a immune reaction after the second dose of the vaccine. As you can see, after the first dose, they didn't mount as much immunity, but by day 43, this is after their second dose of vaccine, old age groups um, develop some immunity. And they, so the same investigators followed the same group for 119 days. So this is about three months after they received their first dose of the vaccine. And as you can see with these lovely colorful lines that the antibodies are still present after three months. So now let's get back to the randomized control trial of 30,000 uh, participants. So that Moderna vaccine were known to be affected 94.1% in preventing symptomatic COVID. Now you have probably heard about the bad anaphylactic attack that some of the patients have received um, after the vaccine. And so they said on the Moderna paper that I reviewed, it was 2.5 cases per million after the first dose. And the median age of uh, individual who did have an, an 
unfortunate anaphylactic attack tend to be of a younger age, mean age about 47. And it seemed to occur in participants who had a history of allergies or allergic reaction or past history of anaphylactic attack past. So these are the individuals that need to be extra cautious after they receive their vaccine. This table shows you some of the reaction that an individual over 65 has experienced after they receive their uh, Moderna vaccine. As you can see from the table, most of the symptoms occurred after the second dose of the vaccine rather than the first one. The majority of the symptoms were fatigue or myalgia or arthralgia and chills, and some have developed some nausea, vomiting, and fever. Again, anecdotally, um, amongst my uh, skilled nursing home residents, uh, they all received the Moderna vaccine. None of them developed any adverse uh, effect, and neither did the other 30 uh, facilities around San Francisco who received the Moderna. Lastly, I will talk to you about the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. This one's different from the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine, as you probably know. This is a viral vector vaccine. So what happens is a harmless adenovirus had been engineered to carry the SARS-2 spike protein. So this is a sparked protein that the COVID uh, viruses have, to which our immune system will mount a antibiotics to try to fight it. Now, this is different in that it only requires a single dose vaccine. You don't need to have it two vaccines. So they did a randomized double-blind placebo trial. They enrolled 30,000 participants. And their outcome data showed that it was 66% protective against moderate and severe COVID illness and 85% protective against severe COVID illness. So you can see the outcome of data for this trial was different from the Pfizer or the Moderna. They wanted to know if they, their vaccine can prevent infection with COVID. It is not like this Johnson & Johnson vaccine outcome, which is to make sure that they did not get a moderate or severe illness or severe illness. Uh, none of the participants in their preliminary studies showed that or receiving receipt uh, needed to be admitted to a hospital. So thank you so much for your attention and we'll take questions at the end. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Cortez, for having me this afternoon. So what I'm going to do is share with you some results from my ongoing NIH work related to flu vaccine, because many of them will, are going to be in play here, and then talk to you about some of the specific kinds of things that you may encounter or questions you may encounter. Next slide, please. So we'll talk a little bit about the factors that predict flu vaccine behavior. Talk a little bit about the common kinds of questions that we hear um, in our community work around COVID and then what you can do to make a difference. Next slide. So we did a national survey, 819 African-Americans, 838 whites. And these are some of the variables that are particularly important when it comes to the COVID vaccine next. And the first one is that older age had powerful associations with much more positive vaccine attitudes with higher perceived risk of disease, lower perceived risk of vaccine side effects, higher trust, highest confidence in the vaccine, and low scores on some of the things like conspiracy theories or use of naturalism in lieu of a flu vaccine. Next. But when perceived risk of side effects increased, then what happened was that uptake decreased and that African-Americans were more likely and to perceive a higher level of perceived side effect risk 
and 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 not just that they thought the risks were greater, but they thought they were much more serious than than they were like death from a flu vaccine. Next. Social norms were also important, and this was particularly true with people who took the flu vaccine every year. And so by social norms, I mean this, that when people believe that others who cared for them wanted them to get the vaccine, they were more likely to take the vaccine. But those that took the flu vaccine every year, and we asked about their behavior over five years, those that took it every year also were more likely to feel that it was their moral obligation to protect others. And these are things that we may, you know, these are all factors that we will encounter later in COVID vaccine. Next. Trust in the healthcare provider and, and the importance of their re uh, recommendation that the healthcare provider's recommendation was vital and that trust in that provider was high. And so this speaks to some of your role also as providers and some of the influence you can have next. And the next thing is knowledge. We all know that knowledge is, is not sufficient necessarily to change our behavior. We'd all probably eat better than we do and exercise more than we do, but it is important. And that we found that the higher level of knowledge about the vaccine, about the vaccine production process, about priority groups, then that was also associated with higher uptake. Next. We, we found in our qualitative work that, that uh, whites and African Americans really didn't understand, you know, why does the flu vaccine get produced every year? Why does it have to get approved every year? And sort of who does all of those steps? And so we actually created an infographic, we tested it before we used it. And what we found was that African Americans had lower trust in all the organizations, you know, from, from doctors, CDC, FDA, drug companies last, but the rank order was the same as whites. That those of older age and higher income also did have higher trust and that higher trust in the vaccine and in this process was associated with higher vaccine uptake. Now, why is this important today? Next slide. So as you just heard, I mean, we've come through a period of, of clinical trials. It was called Operation Warp Speed. And so what we have found in our community work and engagement is that there's a lot of concern about the process. Most of the public doesn't know much about clinical trials. They don't have any reason to. Many healthcare providers may not know a lot about them because it's just not as relevant to their day-to-day -day practice. So one of the things you will encounter is, well, why? how was it accelerated? And, and did it compromise safety in any way? And so I think there are a couple of clear things for, for the, to have in your hip pocket when talking to people, is that these researchers use existing clinical trial networks. That typically when we make vaccines, what happens is we wait until they go through the entire process, which is years before manufacturing. Manufacturing started while these trials are underway. The FDA's whole approval process started while the trials are underway. These vaccines, the mRNA, are, are faster to produce. The other thing that people ask about was, was it political? Was there political pressure? And I think what's important to understand is there were three independent bodies that reviewed this data. First, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, not hired by the drug companies, hired by NIH, that reviewed data literally every weekend. Then once they, the companies are ready to submit to the Food and Drug Administration, there's the Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, VERPAC. Again, totally independent of FDA, 
that reviewed all the data and made their recommendation. And then finally, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices that advises CDC. So there were a lot of independent reviews. The other thing is that the FDA, that made it go fast, or two more things. One is the number of cases, that the, the larger the trials and the more disease in the community, the faster the trials can go but also that FDA and CDC really prioritized and they started working from long before these trials were over with the companies to um, facilitate the review of the products. Next, please. One of the other things that we hear a lot is are there people like me in the trials and was it safe and effective? And we already heard a discussion about age and, um, but these were large trials, unusually large trials. And for many of the groups I work with, which are uh, racial and ethnic minorities, knowing that having 13% Hispanic, almost 10, it wasn't quite 10 in Pfizer, 6% Asian, um, makes a difference. Same thing with Moderna, having 20% Hispanic, 10% Black, Asian, and that there was representation of older adults in each one, and that there were no significant differences in safety or efficacy. And this is vital for people who are saying, but, you know, were people like me, you know, is it safe for people like me? Next, please. There are myths certainly out there about messenger RNAs. Next. One of the myths is that it will alter our DNA. It does not alter our DNA. It does not interact with the nucleus of our cells. Next. It will give me COVID-19. That's a famous you know, myth about flu, is that the virus is live in these vaccines. It will give us the, the, the disease itself. There is no virus in the vaccine, cannot give you COVID-19. Next. It's brand new, never been tried, but actually that's not the case. There have been a lot of of clinical trials um, used to look at other infectious diseases using the MNRA, yes, um, vaccines next. There is also a a, a myth that it can affect uh, fertility. There is no evidence to suggest that it um, it affects fertility. Next. And there's also a myth that it contains fetal tissue or microchips that will track what we do or other kinds of devices, and, and that is not the case. Next. I think the other, so how do we do something that helps to increase trust and confidence and, and increase uptake? Next. So we know that that as we're talking to patients, as we're talking to family members, that steering them in the right direction toward accurate information about COVID and the vaccine and the process and the recommendations for the priority groups important. One of the things we know that we often do is that we address disease risk, but we often forget to to sort of validate and understand that people want to hear about side effects risks and that we need to to hear their concerns and and share what we know about side effects. And finally, you know, that strengthening some of the the norms around both the individual benefit and the collective benefits of vaccine for our communities, our families. Next. So a couple of last things here is changing social norms is really vital. And, and one of the things we found is people have to make, you know, have to sort of make room for conscious discussions about this to, to and for many African Americans in our study, they said they had to consciously decide to trust. It wasn't an automatic decision to trust. Letting your loved one know you want them to take the vaccine is a powerful, um, powerful tool for us to use. And so talking with families and as caregivers, you know, you can actually be part of changing some of these norms. Next. 
So next, the role of healthcare providers. Many people come in, they may be hesitant. That doesn't mean they're gonna refuse. So we have to be empathetic. Next, we have to be ready to, to say it's okay to have questions and concerns and be able to answer and respond to them. Next. Acknowledging what we know from the science today, what we're still learning, and in fact, acknowledging uncertainty that things will change as we learn more, even though we're almost a year into this in the United States. Next. Being ready to answer the questions about safety and efficacy, particularly if, you know, for those that you're working with older adults and their caregivers, they want to know that. And so data that says some of the stronger side effect reactions, totally expected ones, were actually among younger adults, may be reassuring. Next. Finally, being a role model and taking the vaccine. As a healthcare provider, as a caregiver, you're important. And when you take the vaccine and can talk about that, that's a powerful tool for you to work with. Next. And finally, recommendations. So many times, you know, I've been in a, in a doctor's office and said, would you like to have the flu vaccine? This is a time for a serious recommendation about it is in your best interest to take the COVID vaccine. We can give it to you right now. So that recommendation coming from you as a trusted provider is important. Next. So let me just thank you for what you do for your patients and, and your community. And thank you for having me today. Great. Thank you so much. Um, again, Dr. Cortez and to the other speakers for the opportunity to talk today. Okay, um, as mentioned before, I'm, I'm Sarah Berry, I'm a geriatrician. I work in a large nursing home and long-term care in Boston, as well as do research with the Marcus Institute. So I'll start by way of disclosures. Uh, our funding comes from the National Institute on Aging. Uh, I'll touch quickly on the epidemiology of COVID-19 in nursing homes to discuss progress with vaccination as well as successful strategies to overcome vaccine hesitancy. So nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities, SNFs, have been the ground zero for this COVID-19 pandemic. SNF residents and staff account for just 1% of the U.S. population, yet they comprise about 6% of all of the COVID-19 cases and 38% of the deaths in this country. We also know that staff and patient cases are inextricably linked. And this is shown nicely in this data from the CDC that plots weekly confirmed COVID-19 cases uh, from the summer until January, the red line of staff and the yellow line of residents. And you see this tight, tight relationship. I think it's very clear then if we're serious about uh, vaccination and, and decreasing um, uh, these COVID-19 outbreaks that we must consider both patients and staff. So starting mid-December, the Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care Program was created. And this was a partnership between Health and Human Services with CVS and Walgreens in order to both provide and administer the COVID-19 vaccines to these high-risk facilities. And fortunately, they made this available to both residents and staff members, not only of SNFs and long-term care facilities, but also assisted living facilities residential care homes and adult family homes. Most facilities in the United States are participating in this program. And in fact, there's only one state that has decided not to participate and nine other states with incomplete participation among SNFs. Now, this program has really um, uh, afforded nursing homes a very convenient way to manage these extreme cold chain storage issues with the vaccine and some of the other administrative hurdles, uh, but it's also come at the expense of a very tight 
height timeline is shown below in this example at the bottom. So each facility is given three dates, three clinic dates, in which they are to administer this vaccine to all staff and patients in the facility. And this shows an example of one of the facilities that we're working with of how tight that timeline is. This particular facility was notified on December 28th of their clinic dates and had just one week to get all staff and patients consented. And then because this was the Pfizer vaccine, had just three weeks in between the first and second clinic and the second and third clinic. So how are we doing with the pharmacy partnership? Uh, this data was published last week showing the percentage of SNF residents and staff who've been vaccinated after the first clinic. On the left, the data is for residents, on the right for staff. And if you look at the y-axis, this is the percentage of facilities that achieve various uh, vaccination uh, targets or, or levels, if you will, after that first clinic. So you can see that for residents, we're doing pretty good. After the first clinic, um, that half of facilities had vaccinated 78% or more of their residents. But you see sort of the inverse um, uh, a relationship for staff, uh, where the, the median percentage of staff members vaccinated after the first clinic was just 38%. Now I'll remind you, there are three clinics. It's not all doom and gloom. This is just the data from the first clinic. This is more recent data unpublished from a single large uh, SNF chain showing the percent vac of staff vaccinated after the second clinic. Um, vaccinated staff are shown in these dark blue bars and overall about 67% of staff had been vaccinated after the second clinic. Um, but you see that the percentages of staff unvaccinated uh, varies markedly by race, with just over 60% of Black staff not being vaccinated, as compared with just over 30% of Asian staff not vaccinated. And this variation also persists by job type. Um, if we look here at nursing aides and medication technicians, the two disciplines who probably have the closest contact um, with our nursing home residents, we see that almost 60% were not vaccinated after the second clinic. And this compares with other disciplines, somewhere between 25 and 30% when you look at housekeeping, social services, and rehab staff. So why the low uptake among staff? Uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Krauss uh, began to touch on this, and uh, one of my colleagues at Brown University, Jill Harrison, has done a number of focus groups with uh, diverse staff across the country just as this vaccine was being launched to help understand this issue. And the, the, the major concerns um, uh, that have been um, uh, revealed as, as part of those focus groups, and many of which we've already talked about, is the speed of development. And people are really concerned about how fast this was developed. There's also concerns about side effects. Um, I think in particular with the first clinic, staff were very worried if they were going to need to take time off. And fortunately, um, it, it looks like not many staff have had to do that. Staff have been hesitant about long-term side effects. And then the misinformation uh, that was mentioned before, and in particular, the microchip and infertility surfaced in these focus groups. So using the results from this focus group and also our, our experience with nursing home, we began to think about what a successful model might look like to improve vaccine uptake among staff. I think it's very clear that this um, uh, model is going to have to contain good information uh, about the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. And because staff tend to like to get their information off social media, um, it's important that at least some of this is distributed electronically um, through messaging. We also know from prior work in nursing homes that interventions seldom work unless you have somebody on the ground really championing the intervention. And so it's important to have a champion or champions um, uh, with direct care staff. 
Um, Dr. Krauss also mentioned, again, some uh, historical uh, mistrust, and in particular, among our um, uh, minority uh, staff. And so I think it's uh, ideal to engage community leaderships and work with uh, community partnerships uh, to garner trust among staff. And finally, we know that when uh, changing health behaviors, that, that positive reinforcement and conveying positive messages are more effective uh, than, than the, the message of guilt or the message of fear when trying to change someone's health behaviors. So our team uh, took these aspects and is currently conducting a cluster randomized control trial to compare the number of SNF residents and staff who receive a COVID-19 vaccine in facilities with usual care versus facilities randomized to this multi-pronged intervention. This schema here shows our uh, randomization um, uh, scheme. Uh, we started with 154 facilities from four different SNF chains, various parts of the country. Uh, and excluded a small number of uh, facilities where the institution felt that the, the homes were too unstable or might be sold. So we ended up with 133 facilities eligible for randomization. And these facilities were uh, stratified uh, according to the number uh, or the percentage of non-white minority uh, residents in each facility. We then did a randomization within these three strata and also, strata, also stratified by the four different SNF chains. So in total, we ended up with 63 facilities in the intervention arm and 70 facilities in usual care. So a little more information on the multi-pronged intervention. So starting with our education by early January, um, uh, really, our, our colleagues at Insight Therapeutics had done a great job of creating a, a website uh, that's really specifically geared towards a nursing home staff and residents, providing accurate information, as well as a series of videos that can be downloaded and shared, uh, targeting uh, nursing home staff. We were also delighted to have uh, uh, Maggie Syme, a really talented project director, join us a few weeks ago. And she's helped us up our game uh, with respect to disseminating education on social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So our uh, facility champions are opinion leaders. So from each of the intervention homes, we, um, we invited the facility to send at least uh, four opinion leaders. And we defined an opinion leader as an outspoken staff, somebody that speaks up and other people listen to, regardless of whether or not that staff plans on getting the vaccine. And we invited them to a series of town hall meetings to give them information about the vaccine. And I'll talk about those next. We plan to uh, uh, try to try to solicit um, uh, uh, community leaders um, and, and to have these opinion leaders identify persons in their community that we could also reach out to host other town hall meetings and give the same uh, uh, message uh, really uh, to garner trust. And finally, um, we uh, strove to have uh, strove to, to give positive reinforcement, uh, really by giving out goodies um, and praise at the time that staff get vaccinated, uh, largely shown here with these masks and t-shirts that have a positive message. So the opinion leader trainings, uh, presently we've conducted 30 town hall meetings with more than 250 staff from 52 of our 63 intervention SNFs. And we initially grouped these by discipline and had pretty similar uh, rates of attendance among the different disciplines. On each call, we have between one to three physicians, typically two, plus a moderator, and we strive for some uh, uh, racial diversity among um, the, the moderators and physicians. We solicit questions from the audience. There is no um, uh, you know, pre-populated lecture or, or slide slow. And, and no matter what the concern that comes in, we really try to validate um, uh, the staff's concern. Whenever possible, physicians use personal stories um, in addition to data to address concerns. 
I think it's been particularly um, uh, salient to, to share stories about our own concerns, our own experiences, uh, or family members um, that have had hesitancy about the vaccines. In addition to giving the opinion leaders information about the vaccine, we also encourage them to speak up when they hear misinformation that really, you know, if they are really the messengers and are gonna be helpful um, in attempts to get others vaccinated. And we've had this slogan, if you hear something, say something. Uh, we provide them with some suggested language on talking to others about the vaccines. And then we follow up quickly uh, with a frequently asked question page with videos that they might wish to share, as well as the $50 gift card thanking them for their time. So what have we learned from these town hall meetings? First, that misinformation from social media is really common. And I know that we heard this from Dr. Krause, we heard this from our opinion leader, I mean, from our focus groups. And I don't think until we started these um, meetings that we knew how prevalent it was. In all 30 meetings, there was either a staff on the phone or, um, you know, had or that had heard somebody else that had concerns about infertility. Infertility, it's just a, a really common concern um, and, and misinformation in this demographic. And it's imperative that we ask staff what they're hearing. Secondly, we noticed that most staff had really done their research, and this was across all disciplines, housekeeping, dietary, um, but they had a few questions that remained that they wanted to address. And one of the benefits of having an open format was that it allowed staff to ask individual questions without having to sit through a predetermined lecture. A third thing that we noticed was that positive experiences uh, and personal experiences were very positive motivators uh, for persons being vaccinated. And one unintended benefit of this open format was that not only did it allow the physicians to share their stories, but it allowed the participants to share their stories. And I think uh, the power of this is illustrated nicely in this quote from a nurse from Nebraska who shared, I got vaccinated so my patients don't have to keep visiting their families through a window. It was very clear that this sort of message, this sort of story resonated with everybody on the call. So a bit about implementation of the other parts of the intervention. Um, I'll just say it's been challenging. Um, you saw the accelerated timeline that we're working with in the earlier slide. And in addition, I think it's worth noting that about a third of these facilities are having COVID-19 outbreaks at the same time that they're trying to do vaccination. And it's really difficult um, to get people to, to, to pick up the phone, uh, much less build relationships during a time of crisis. Uh, however, uh, free gifts are very popular. And while we only got 52 of our facilities to send people to the opinion leader trainings, um, all 63 facilities were happy to give our free gifts. Um, I showed the mask and the t-shirts earlier. These are the stuffed animals. Um, and finally, it really takes time to engage community leaders. While we had hoped really to solicit from the opinion leaders, um, uh, local community leaders that we could work with, we just have not been that successful uh, with the exception of one community leader that joined in an additional call um, and engaging them and instead are looking for regional and national leaders that can help us in, in getting out this important message. So I'll close by saying thanks, um, and I really am so fortunate to work with so many different uh, talented people um, in, in getting this trial going. Um, I look forward to, to seeing the results in the coming months, and if you're interested in learning any more or seeing our website, uh, I have it listed here. Thank you. Dr. Cortez, I think you're still muted. Thank you so much. I just wanted to thank each one of you, Dr. Berry, Dr. Krause Quinn, and Dr. Yukawa for wonderful presentations. And we've got several questions that have come through. And I think one of the later ones was came out of your discussion on the electronic messaging, um, Dr. Berry. And it was followed up by one on the inequity of um, the digital divide. So 
I think I'd like all three of you to participate in the discussion, but how do we overcome when we talk about going into, um, into the digital world? I, I know here in New York, there is something called New York City Vaccine Finder. And um, I had trouble with it. And I'm thinking to myself, how do people that are, are even less uh, digitally capable than I, uh, how can they possibly know how to get a va find a vaccine using this New York City vaccine finder? So given that for older people, as well as for the staff who might be, um, who might live in marginalized um, communities, uh, and we do know that some people don't even have broadband, so how can we address some of these issues when people don't have access? I'll jump in and start. And you know, your point is very well taken and, and we see the same thing here in my area as well. Um, but it, I think that's, you know, in, in today's world, we automatically go to the idea of social media and the digital, you know, resources we have at our hands. But this is one where really the old fashioned, every channel we can use for health communication around this, we have to use. And so Dr. Barry talked about, you know, the opinion leaders who are really using their interpersonal channels, community leaders, be they faith leaders, um, radio, local radio hosts, um, you know, the person that runs the senior center, you know, that, that preparing everything that, um, you know, information for them, language for them, you know, helping them find the resources. And, you know, I think one of the things I really like to see many communities do is operationalized phone banks, particularly for older adults. I work with my neighbor across the street who's 84 and uses her iPad and text, but still, just as you said, what you have to do to get through these systems to get an appointment has just you know, frustrated her um, terribly. Um, so I think every mechanism, interpersonal, radio, TV, community organizations, door-to-door -door flyers, that's what we're gonna to have to do. Dr. Barry? No, I like all of those suggestions and I agree, it's gonna to have to be multi-pronged. There's not gonna be one approach that's gonna reach everybody. Um, I'll comment one of the things that we had not um, quite anticipated with the opinion leaders is that um, many of the nursing home staff um, don't regularly use email. So um, even getting them, you know, we needed the, the carrot was we'll give you a $50 gift card, but we need your email to, to give it. And that was, uh, you know, it was very clear that some either didn't have email or, or never used it. But the vast majority were involved in social media. Um, and it, it takes time to, to, to infiltrate that. Um, but I, I, I do think there's um, tremendous power and in, in, in possibility in getting a, a positive message out. Dr. Yukao. So I know in San Francisco, I can't speak about what happens in the Southern California, but at least in San Francisco, Department of Health, the people are actually reaching out to different skilled nursing home, assisted living, board and care, because it, like, like I said, they may not be using social media or, or whatever, and whatever means old fashioned telephone calls, email, social media, they're going out there and then talking to them, providing information so that they in turn, the the facility leaders can then disseminate it to, um, to make sure that the residents and their uh, participants can get vaccinated. But again, I agree, these are older individuals who are not as good with social media or tech, so we have to, to do the old fashioned way, but it's going to take time. Um, I know our governor does noon conferences every single day on TV. So if the older folks are listening in, they may get some information. But again, he would say, go on this webpage and then find out, well, it may not be that easy as 
Tara said, sometimes people go on these websites and then it's like, okay, it's not very user friendly. So old fashioned way, I agree. Community leaders, any way we can, even town hall or any very smaller, I think the smaller the better, not top down, but like really disseminate in their local individual city, town halls, to try to get um, the messages out for the older individual. One of the questions, a couple of questions came through and I will, I'll just take a quick moment and answer these. A lot of people are asking for education <clears throat> resources, educational resources and um, large print fact sheets, in different languages, where are the resources for education? And I would suggest um, the COVID Prevention Network has a lot of resources for education and also the CDC. And does anyone, is there, are there other ones that anyone can think of that people could go to? Each state may have some, I know San Francisco Department of Public Health have their own little version for uh, public, um, for, for regular people, as well as for uh, healthcare providers. So you can be Right, because I know you're, 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 you're right. I know New York City, the Department of Health in the city has it as well as the state. So your local um, places, your local health departments would also be, um, be a place you could go. Uh, here's a question that the, four of us had discussed prior to our hopping on with all of you today. Do people who have had COVID need any vaccine at all or could they only have one vaccine? So I'm gonna throw this out to the group. You, Dr. Yukawa, let's start with you. I'm glad we chat about this before our webinar, <laughs> but the current recommendation, and again, it's hard to change anything. Uh, I think we should go by the current recommendation, whatever Dr. Fauci has said, I go by what he says. <laughs> you still need to have vaccines and you still need to have two doses. Um, the data that I showed you, you can see that they do so much better after the second dose. However, the data that I shared with you are these are individuals who did not have COVID vaccine. So we don't have a data on what happens to people who get vaccinated after they've already had their COVID um, infection. We don't. And I guess the same would hold for, because another question was, what if you have COVID when you have your injection? I guess we don't know. Is right. that the answer? That is, that is the answer. We do not have the data right now. What we're gathering is what we have. So what we're going through now will be much more important to find out. Nothing in the clinical trials have ever done things like that. They do not count for these kind of changes. So for now, two vaccines. Uh, except for Johnson & Johnson, it's only one vaccine. Right. Dr. Berry, Dr. Quinn, do you have anything to add to that or no, that was a very common question among the town halls that we do. And I always, you know, pointed out that, um, that, that the, in the studies, when people get vaccinated, they get higher levels of antibodies than if you just had COVID without the vaccine. So we, we think we're, we're hopeful that the higher levels of antibodies translate into greater and, and longer protection. Uh, another question, um, and this came out of um, Dr. Kraus Quinn's uh, uh, talk on trust and manufacturing, and I, I think the way it was presented, there was there was a, a presumption that the fact that they were manufactured at the same time as uh, they were being developed added to trust. And I, I I'll speak on that for a moment, and then I'll turn it over to you. But I, I think the idea is not it was not so much that about trust, it's about the speed. And how did we get it out so quickly? And we got it out so quickly because normally it would take the development of the vaccine, which takes a while, and then the manufacturing of the vaccine. And instead of that, they just went on the hunch that this would work. Dr. Kraus Quinn, is that what your intent was? That is exactly what my intent was. And, you know, I think, I mean, had we gotten to the point Theoretically speaking, where we did not have a good vaccine, then that would have been discarded. Um, so fortunately, we were at a point where we the data was strong on safety and efficacy. And by starting it earlier, and I will say part of, and this goes to the trust, 
Um, the whole process of seeking emergency use authorization is complicated as, as is seeking a biologics license um, approval for, a, you know, which we do routinely all the time. And so that included lots of data analysis and, and review, lots of materials submitted months ahead of time um, by the companies and inspections by FDA of manufacturing place, quality control procedures, those kinds of things. So yes, that was done to help speed it up and through, but there were none of the steps that were skipped along the way. They did the inspections, they looked at safety control, they tested you know, the vaccine, all of those things. Mm -hmm. If we if they didn't manufacture at the same time, it would have taken another six or eight months to get the vaccine to the market, and that's at, why at least yes, at right. least yes, right. right. Um, Dr. Yukawa, this one is specific to you. It is um, a couple things. The did we uh, oh did we do? I know you answered the one on the uh, older adults. What were the differences between Pfizer and J and J with the incidence of infections for older adults? in the trials. Okay, so since Johnson & Johnson is fairly new, it was really difficult for me to find any kind of information. So I don't think there's a head-to-head -head comparison between the Johnson & Johnson and Moderna or Pfizer that I can find. Uh, not to say that it hasn't been done, but I could not find it in the uh, public literature or not in the medical literature. So I could tell you, which is, Better. I don't know if Dr. Barry, Dr. Quinn. I even went to the FDA site um, that Dr. Quinn has suggested, which is the FDA advisory board, which is the committee that actually reviews all the data. There's nothing on Johnson & Johnson yet because they're still being under investigation. So I'm sorry that I cannot provide that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think an interesting question that came up was community-based organizations. What can CBOs do to promote vaccinations, particularly in marginalized uh, neighborhoods? Well, I, I'll jump in. I, CBOs are really important. And I think because number one, they are often organizations that grew out of those communities and are more trusted. And, and have their ear to the ground, so to speak. They may also have a whole array, as we were talking earlier, ways that they communicate with their, with their members, their constituents, the people they serve that will, you know, address our concern about, you know, not relying too much on social media, which may leave some people out. The other thing is they're really, I mean, they are a partner for many of us in agencies and all to listen to as part of, you know, kind of our, our sounding board. What are you hearing? What are the concerns? You know, what kinds of questions are arising? You know, we have found that to be really valuable for us and helping to understand both the misinformation, the myths, you know, the questions people have. Anyone else want to comment? No, I really like that suggestion. And one additional uh, benefit in, in partnering with, you know, communities like that and, and kind of keeping your ear to the ground is this information is changing. I mean, the, the concerns that we heard on the town halls the first week of January versus the first week of February, uh, yes, infertility was the same, but many of the other concerns, you know, were, were changing. And, and um, so I think it's very important to kind of have an ear on the ground and uh, with, with what people are concerned about at that moment. And one last question, and I think this is kind of an ethical one. What do you think of mandates for vaccination for staff and what about financial incentives? That is a tough one, I'll give it a crack, but I work in a veterans uh, administration and I know they can't really mandate either. It is very difficult because 
particularly Dr. Berry said, the, the nursing staff are the ones who are a little bit more hesitant and they are union identity. They have the unions that we have to deal with. So I think mandating them to do anything would be very difficult. And I know some organizations are giving out uh, financial incentives. I, I know some of the long-term cares here in the city are, if, if you get your second shot, they're giving you $100. So there are financial incentives being given. I, I think the, um, the mandate is a difficult question because not only is it all of these things of not the trust of the government, I don't trust the government, I don't trust the doctors, I don't trust the scientists, I don't trust... But you know, we come into the ideo ideological question of, do I have a say about what happens to me? And this is me. And can somebody tell me that I have to have a vaccine and perhaps infect my body? Um, it's a personal choice. And I think that's something that we really have to think more about and um, dig deeper into how do we we change the philosophy, the paradigm with which some people approach the, their bodies. Mm -hmm. Sarah, you look like you were about to, or, or Sandra, you look like you're about to, somebody's going to talk. <laughs> I, I, uh, I agree. I, you know, I, I have some ethical concerns about mandating the vaccine as much as I want staff, you know, as many staff to be vaccinated as possible. Um, you know, I, I, I think I have no problem with sort of positive incentives and whether it be financial or I think if your facility can, um, you know, I, I think another alternative is, you know, allowing staff to have a, a day off, you know, a paid day off where there's some value and it shows them that you, you know, um, you know, there, there's a trend that if you have side effects that we're going to take care of you and we're not going to uh, penalize you for, you know, not being able to come into work. Um, obviously, not all facilities are able to staff that, but I think that is, um, anyway, one, one alternative. Dr. Kress Quinn? Yeah, it's, I, yes, they're both fraught in many ways with challenges, particularly the mandates, and they haven't, you know, we've periodically looked at those, but never really adopted them in, in a significant way. But I, I go back to, is there a, a positive reinforcement, some sort of other incentive, financial or a day off? But I also think about the, the line Dr. Barry showed us, you know, the mirror image of the infections among staff and the infections among patients and deaths. And, and somehow or other, you know, I, I, I want to think that many people working in facilities are working in facilities and care about their patients. And so how do we help to tap into, you know, their, their concern about patients, you know, as well as their concern about their own families so that they can begin to see this as something that will protect the people that are there to serve, but also protect their families and others around them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think positive reinforcement, financial incentives, because right now it's really, let's get these shots in arms because what's coming toward us, you know, Dr. Mike Osterholm in Minnesota calls it, you know, it's like the the category five hurricane, it's 250 miles off the coast, but now the sun's shining. And so you're saying, well, I don't have to think about that. That's, well, it's 250 miles off the coast, the variants. There, it's now in the country. And what do we do to stop us from being overwhelmed by that? So time to be afraid. Did you want to say something? Dr. Yukawa? Yeah. And I do know some hospitals in New York, they do, they, the private, some of the private hospitals do require um, flu vaccines or you don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it can be mandated. And I think that's where the, mm -hmm. the ethical question of the philosophy of the organization <clears throat> and, the, and the, the board of the trustees comes into effect is to, what is the philosophy of the organization and where do you, is it the patients 
residents or is it the staff whose rights, so to speak, you need to protect? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a this could be a debate, a very very well well done debate. Well, we're after the top of the hour. It's four oh five. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sarah Berry, Dr. Sandra Krauss Quinn, Dr. Mishi Yukawa. Having your wisdom and expertise come together in this forum has just been wonderful. And as I look at the questions and answers, I see a lot of people thanking us for this wonderful information. We will, um, as I've told some of you in the in the question and answer box, this will, this was recorded. It will be posted on the H I G N dot org website so you can go back and look at it again and uh, you can see all the slide presentations there. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful a wonderful afternoon and be sure to get your shots when you're able to. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.